All right, there we go. Um, and we just realized that we're recording this at the same time that Ray Sanders is doing his, his show. I can't hear you. Are you muted? Yeah, no, I'm not. Sorry. Yeah, we didn't mean to do that. Sorry, this Ray. This was a pure, uh, we were just accident. trying to get ahead, and we were both free, and we didn't look. We're sorry, Ray. So if you, we highly recommend you go over and check out Ray Sanders' show. Don't worry about this boring show. Check out what Ray Sanders is doing. We'll be on YouTube later. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, don't worry about this. Watch his show, Ray Sanders, Cosmic Ray, happening right now. Uh, okay, well, let's get ready to record. So we're going to do an, our second episode, and we'll stick around and answer some questions. This time we're going to talk about creating a science society, which yes. I'm sure we will both just go off on for hours. No. <laughs> no, no. We you could, have... but I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, it's 10 p.m. here, and, and while usually that's quite early, tomorrow I have to go do teacher professional development quite early in the morning. Uh, okay, well, let's get let's get recording so we minimize our impact on Ray's show. Um, I'm ready to press record. And then I am pressing record, and okay. it's recording. Sweet. Okay, here we go. Starting to cast episode three hundred nine for Monday, June third, twenty thirteen. Creating a sciency society. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing really well. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, do we have anything we need to let people know to do? Uh, just another reminder. Although we're, you know, it's, we're still past the CosmoQuest Hangoutathon. If you have some time and or money, uh, by all means, let people know about the fact that CosmoQuest is still looking for donations. And go to yeah. CosmoQuest.org/slash/donate. And and I think we've had some people ask, like, what is the difference between donating for CosmoQuest and donating for Astronomy Cast? It's different sets of humans that do somewhat overlap. So when you donate to Astronomy Cast, you're paying for Preston to edit the show. You're paying uh, for Nancy Atkinson to prepare our show notes. You're paying for transcription. Um, and you're helping us with all the random things that we need gear. During, from gear to hard drives to lighting. Um, which I'm clearly not using right now. Right. <laughs> Our attic is still a wreck from the hangout we did over the weekend. Yep. Um, when you donate to CosmoQuest, you're actually paying for uh, us to generate citizen science programs that you can take part in and help us discover our solar system. Uh, we have noisy astronomer Nicole Gugliucci on staff full time. Corey Lehens, our lead developer. Joe Moore is a graduate student who's a developer on the project. We have an educational team that is working. Uh, we're running a one week teacher professional development workshop this week, and donating to CosmoQuest helps our three people who are our educational coordinators go out. Out, and we provide these teachers with things to use in their classroom as well as with content to use in their classroom. Um, so CosmoQuest just takes everything a whole lot further in enabling uh, people to learn and do science more effectively. So I've got two things to promote. One is we've updated our Phases of the Moon app. Whoops. For, <laughs> updated our Phases of the Moon app for Universe Today. And uh, and we put in really high resolution images into the, into the Phase app, which was what people were complaining about. So now it looks really nice. When you zoom in, it's really high resolution. I'm really happy with that. The second thing is I've been doing a bunch of really short kind of explainer videos on my YouTube channel, which have been getting a lot of great feedback. They're like three minutes long and uh, you know we cover one topic but uh, and that's over on Universe Today's YouTube channel which I think you may you may enjoy so if you and, and if we're just gonna keep promoting things well, I, I think have, we're out of time we're out of time I have one more to... thing to okay. add um, 365 days of astronomy is still going and we introduced two recent series space scoops which is designed for children um, and weekly space stories I am narrating both of those under my narration name which is Pamela Kavion just for professional reasons, I keep the two separate. Um, so please go check those out. Um, enjoy your fiction. Enjoy your space stories for kids. Um, yeah. People always good. say that you should uh, do voice narration for things. So, And I took them up on it. Awesome. 
Um, okay, great. Well, let's get let's get rocking. Um, so here we go. Um, our modern society depends on science. It impacts the way we eat, work, communicate, and play. And yet most people take our amazing scientific advancement for granted, and some are even hostile to it. What can we do to spread the love of science through our education, outreach, and media? So uh, this is just nonstop baffling to me because I think, yeah. and for you as well, because we both we're both super geeks, super nerds, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Both, you know, I know there's some like distinct, you know, distinction between what is a geek and what's a nerd. Whatever, I'm both. Um, and we have always been interested in science and technology and deeply appreciated the impact and role that this plays in our lives. And I, and I know we're preaching to the choir here with the people who yeah. listen to the show and watch what we do and come to our star parties every Sunday night. I think someone said, this is the geekiest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and I love it. So, <laughs> you know, so that is, you know, we are... You know, I think you, I'm hoping, watching this really as well, understand just how much, you know, how much all of this, this means to us and how much yeah. we appreciate it. But the vast majority of society doesn't. Does not get it. Doesn't get Does it. Does not get it. And yet they depend on it. You know, they've got these, these magical phones that... You know, then you know it's not magic; yeah. it's science that do all these amazing things. GPS that requires relativity and <laughs> physics and air, uh, aerospace engineering. Yeah. Yeah, and yet, and yet, people just take this stuff all for granted. And mm -hmm. in and the worst cases, you know, I mean, those of us in the skeptical movement really have to deal with this, this hostility towards science. Yeah. Yeah, the this notion that if I can't instantly understand something um, and instantly understand its application, it must be wrong, bad, dangerous, evil, um, I don't or like simply it. not worthwhile. I mean, that's that's one thing I run into a lot is the well, why should we fund what you do? You're just an astronomer. You're not giving back to society. And it wears on you after a while. It makes me think that my life would be more appreciated as a voice actress. And uh, <laughs> right. it, it, it depresses me to no end that the going rate for an average voice actress is, uh, oh, 10 times the going rate for an astronomer. And and yet, you know, there are hundreds of people who attempt to get every single astronomy position. Yeah. You yeah. know. So it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of people chasing, not a lot of jobs. So I guess what would a science society, and, you know, this is me inventing words again, um, what would that look like, do you think? If we could, I, you know, at, at the most simplistic level, imagine if every science fiction television show or other form of speculative fiction show had a science advisor who was listened to with the, the same respect that Kevin Grazier eventually found himself being listened to on Battlestar Galactica. Um, imagine a, a society where uh, people thought that it was cool and normal to problem solve how to fix something rather than just buying a new one. Uh, it's that combination of having the respect to go out and find the, the person who has the know-how and ask, and that desire to figure things out on your own, like the Maker Society. If we could combine that respect for intellect and that uh, respect and desire to be part of making things, I think that's what it would look like. Um, we're not yeah. there, though. Yeah, and we're really, really fortunate in this in the kind of science space community that we have. You know, yeah. we're really found on Google Plus and and on Twitter and so, you know science online and these these groups. There's a lot of women that are actively engaged. I mean, when we see the weekly yeah. space hangout, you know, it's you and Amy Shear Title and Nicole and you know Emily Lakdawalla and there's just so many you know really knowledgeable women. But yeah, but that's fairly rare when you look at the at the bigger numbers. You know, it, it, it's it, actually a very odd selection effect. Um, one of the things that you find is that by and large, more people who go into the sciences or the physical sciences at least and the engineering sciences are men. Of those who do both men and women make it into the fields, the women are more likely to end up in the education research and the communication paths. Mm. So what you're seeing is um, in the sciences, yeah, you've got 
lots and lots of men, but you preferentially end up with women in the communications roles. Now, you know, I've never had anybody really give me a hard time about my love of science and technology, you know, even growing up. I was always encouraged. I went to engineering at, at UBC. I went to computer, you know, I got my computer science degree. But yeah. for you, you yeah. know, what was it like <laughs> growing up as a woman who was that interested in, in science? You know, did you find that this anti kind of science-y society was, was working against you? Well, it's not even just the anti sciency but also the in anti-intellectual. Uh, you get tired of being smart, being a curse, and you can't excel in science and try and hide your intelligence at the same time. So you're fighting the fact of, oh crud, I'm getting made fun of because I like science, and the oh crud, I'm getting made fun of because I'm smart. And then you're also facing all the gender bias from the physics teacher who gave me a C because he wanted to teach me a lesson about how women don't belong in science, and it was better to learn young than to waste my life trying to be a scientist and I wish this was a joke but it's true this is what happened to me my senior year of high school um, it's it's never ending from the you don't look like a scientist shock <laughs> with a bit of appallment um, yeah. someone finds out to it, it gets to the point that you either go into a situation ready to like apologetically admit that you're a scientist or ready to own it with the type of, of self-confidence that gets taken as you're scary. Um, it's hard. It's really just hard. And, and did you find that, you know, growing up for you, that kind of backlash or that sort of, you know, anti-intellectualism, I mean, do those go hand in hand, do you think? Do you think that sort of intellectualism and interest in science go hand in hand? Um. I think of the people who eventually fight to make it in science, you have to also at a certain level, at most levels, be an intellectual. The The pair down project process for science is huge. Uh, in physics astronomy, I, I know in my personal classes, I went from 70 people in the first astronomy class I took. Most of them weren't majors, but that's where the majors were. Next semester, there was 12 of us. Of the 12, five of us graduated. Of the five of us who graduated, three of us got PhDs. Of the three of us who got PhDs, two of us are still in the field. I then went to Texas for graduate school. Um, of the 18 of us that started at Texas, uh, three of us got PhDs. That's a huge pair down. Um, yeah. 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 So, and then and, you look at how many stay in the field after that. It's just this constant loss of people uh, just because there's not jobs, there's not positions, and it is such a long, hard fight. And then we look at, like, you know, what's on popular television, you know, yeah. and, you know and you get, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to make this a rant about, you know, the, the sort of, how bad society has gotten to in kids these days and so on because, you know, but I mean, you get Jersey Shore and you get all these terrible reality shows and, Yeah, you know, and, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. It's possible to have positive uh, thought processes. It's rare, but it's possible in these reality shows. One, one of my guilty pleasures is I watch on Hulu this sci-fi channel reality show uh, called Face Off, which is uh, about doing uh, special effects makeup, and they're forever. That you can't do because that's not anatomically correct. And so you have people looking through anatomy books and looking through what exists in the natural world seeking uh, inspiration and they're getting downgraded for not having things that are physically realistic. And so we also see situations like, you know, look at the Mythbusters, obviously, which yes. is a huge success and, you know, yeah. immensely uh, popular with people. And I think, you know, that really crosses lines. I mean, and maybe, hmm, you know, I mean, you get the situation where these people are blowing things up and testing out things that are gross and weird and stuff like that. But, the, you know, if you peel that part of it back, there's a, you know, there's a really good science lesson going on there about testing, about, um, you know, about putting in controls, about, yeah. you know, how science really works and people can really watch it unfold in front of them. 
And, and one of the other things that's kind of awesome is the the shows that are either speculative fiction or science fiction that incorporate science the most realistically are often, not always, but they're often the more successful. People are forever panning Armageddon because uh, it had really bad science. Um, now, Deep Impact had its science somewhat better and gets ignored because it just wasn't a great movie. Um, but then you look at the the modern wave of post Armageddon shows that are on television right now. There's Revolution, Defiance, Falling Skies, and Revolution has about the worst science of it, and it's also one of the least critically acclaimed of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's that scientific realism that you have in Falling Skies and Defiance that that really adds something to the shows. Now, is it just sort of now you know Western culture that has a problem with this? I mean. You know, Canada and these states are very similar in the situation, and you know, and I'm assuming you know England, places like that are very similar. Australia they have it to a lesser degree. In, but if in, you're in Korea or Japan, oh, they totally, take science they want, fairly seriously, right? In they China, take it very especially in China, where they see it, and and in fact, in much of the developing world, they they see uh, their intellectual students as the people who have the chance to will better their society to better their own lives. Uh, the phrase tiger mom is is largely derogatory here in America and it refers to the way Asian parents work so hard to see their children succeed. And it bothers me at a certain level that um, parents that fight too hard to see their children succeed, it's it's something that's that harshly looked down upon and and yes you can go way overboard in helping your child succeed i sure that. right but the point being that you know if a person is good in science in yes. korea or japan or in china they're that's praised, not, they're celebrated that, yeah that's not seen as a bad thing that's not seen as a mm -hmm. weird thing and do you think maybe that's almost like you get the situation where the science has made such a difference and it's so ingrained into the culture that you take it for granted and now suddenly you don't need to you're not directly connected to the value that you're getting from the science. I, I'm not sure where it is. One, one of the things that I, I want to find a sociologist to talk to this about is you see in countries like Finland where education is highly regarded, school teachers are highly paid about the same as they pay their doctors. Here in the United States, that's not true. Um, I've heard Brittany Schmidt, who's an amazing researcher. She's the one that figured out how hydraulics plays a role in the uh, ice motion on Europa. Brilliant woman. And I heard her talking about how here she is in her early 30s, so proud to finally be living in an apartment without roommates while she's watching her friends from high school buy houses. And the reason that she's just now finally able to have an apartment without a roommate is because scientists are so poorly paid by and large uh, in the academics. That's not true in industry, but in academics it is. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have postdoctoral post positions, which is what most of us have for 12 years, I escaped that, but most do, that often pay $40,000 and you have starting faculty positions in some universities that pay $30,000. That says something about how society values science. Now, do you think that, that the tide is shifting a little bit? I mean, I see things like, um, you know, back 20 years ago or whatever, there was no good reason to be into video games and comic books and science and all these kinds of computers, you know, in that, in that you know, the way you were seen. You know, like there was no, you know, for a lot of the mass majority of the bullies, et cetera, there was no, no social value to be into those kinds of things, you know, like role-playing games. I was the, I was the, you know, I organized role-playing game clubs in my various uh, school oh, classes I and stuff. Oh, I D&D. Yeah, I exactly. I did D&D basic back in the day. So, you know, there was, you know, socially that was seen as really kind of weird, but now everybody plays video games. Everybody has a computer. Everybody uses a smartphone. You know, there, there's that's considered normal. And if you're in, and and everybody goes and watches but, the big. But there's still those delineations where not everyone does World of Warcraft. That's the new D and D. Mm -hmm. Not everyone does D and D still. Um, so I I think the social games are still skewed, whereas. Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, all those things when we were children, everyone played those. Everyone had an Atari, it seemed like. It was the multi-user games that were always askew. 
Um, and and so it's it's that weird. It's okay for a jock to be totally into playing uh, the arcade style games, but not totally okay to play the World of Warcraft style games. Now, if I can grant you unlimited political power mm -hmm. to kind of affect policy in the United <laughs> States, yes, um, and Canada, why not? Go ahead, you can lead us. Um, okay, what would you do? you know, to kind of encourage a, an interest in, in science and to help, you know, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of these big risks, and I think this is this, this existential yeah. risk that a lot of people are worried about in the United States is, is the situation where the United States falls behind for, in terms of science to the rest of the world. What would yeah. you do if you could sort of, you know, if you had a few billion dollars that you could affect policy, you could, you know, make changes, what would you do? A few billion. So a few at, hundred billion? I mean, did whatever you want. Okay, whatever. So, whatever. So I'm it, opening up the coffers. The U.S. as a, you know, as a Canadian, I'm opening up the U.S. coffers to your disposal. What will you do to, to try and encourage and help, you know, make science more of a, a priority in, in U.S. society? At, at the couple billion level, I think what we really need is a society that uh, is better able to understand how cool and awesome science can be and one of the best ways to do that um, I, I hate saying this it's it's through robotics is you get kids learning how to program how to build both on the software and hardware side uh, robotics to solve various problems uh, you get adults free maker space um, if we had maker centers in every town and free courses that people could engage in um, so that they could celebrate their own technical solutions, low-cost 3D printers, um, introduce people to the power that comes from knowing how to do problem solving. And then on the other side of this, free up R&D budgets so that there, there's more money for innovation, there's more money uh, to discover both on the basic research side and then the applied research side. Um, we don't have significant money being spent on R&D right now and, and that's, that's frankly terrifying. So it's this twofold, you have to engage people in the process. It's not enough to simply teach, teach facts, teach figures. You need them doing science and I think that the best, most effective way um, is often through robotics and robotics can get tied in with astronomy and aerospace. There are programs to build uh, auto, uh, artificial intelligence um, suborbital gliders. There is the Moonbots program with the Google Lunar X Prize to build robots that have capacities to rove over moon-like surfaces. Um, and, and then maker spaces, if we can get, imagine if the way post-World War II, um, admittedly mostly sons worked with their fathers on the car and on the fixing the television and everything else, that was such a powerful experience both for the family and for learning. Imagine if it became maker spaces where moms and dads took their sons and daughters to build things for fun instead of sitting around watching movies on the sofa while playing on their smartphones. You really want a maker bot, don't you? I, I really do. I can tell. Um, I want one too. It'd be awesome. Um, you know, so this is funny because I think you are always the sort of grim realist and I am the breathless optimist of this, <laughs> of this team. And I think that you can't lead a horse, or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. That you know, that you can't push a string, that that the tremendous accomplishments made in science and, and technology in the United States has has given your culture so much of a head start and advantage in the sort of the world economy that it's only natural for people to be taking it for granted at this point that they're coasting, you know, well, in many I, cases. And I know. and I think that that you know you're having the situation where you know how do you compare and contrast where most people kind of turn their nose at science and they don't really care and they don't understand how it works and they aren't contributing to it from their taxes and so on and then you look at a place like China or Japan or Korea you know especially China where they take it like it's you know super serious it's a it's a life or death race to the top and and I think 
putting Japan and China in the same boat is is a very poor thing True. to do no, no, because I'll, they have yeah. completely different motivations. Yeah. Japan is a first world nation. Yeah. It it is technologically far more advanced than we are. Um, going there, suddenly I realize how little technology has infiltrated my life. China, on the other hand, is, is a nation that that has great extremes across the country. And, and America has that too, but not to the same level. We do have issues in the Ozarks. We do have issues in the Leeward Island where there are communities that are really third world, but they're small, and this is a small fraction of our nation. In China, that's turned on its head where you do have vast areas that are still very much developing and it's in those areas that they recognize their smart child they will give up anything including giving their child good estate run schools in order to see that child be able to join this first world society of the technologically elite. Um, Japan's actually a really interesting example of some place that because of the smallness of the nation and the need to to mechanize things and also because they they have a very inverted population where they do have so many older people um, they've had to turn to technology to solve problems from reading books to children to providing companions for the elderly and it's a country where robots are an answer um, right I, and I wish so we could <laughs> we could emulate that yeah so I wonder if you know it's more going to be a situation where the technology is going to continue advancing and people will it'll just be more and more disconnected for people and they won't really understand and they won't be engaged with it and the people who are will become more and more specialized you know you will become a warp field you know coil engineer right and yeah, you just I, I and all know. you understand are warp field dynamics you know, it, like from the from the Star Trek universe. It's 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 interesting how we're ending up in such a clicky society. You and I live in circles where we uh, consume science focused music. We read books from authors uh, who take time to find PhDs to advise them on their science. We. Uh, hang out with people who are solving some of the great software problems out there and developing amazing new hardware. We have self-selected to live in a subculture, counterculture, I don't know, that is focused on living more facts-based, living more science-inspired realities. But we are embedded in cultures where that's not uniformly true. Uh, I ride horses and and I, I'm seeing this this rift between those of us who choose to live connected lives and those who um, askew that as other, askew that as uh, improper, as not necessary. And I worry that the cultural biases against uh, diving into technology and intellectualism are going to lead, at least in America, to the digital divide between those who are connected and those aren't uh, growing stronger and stronger, even though the costs to be connected are dropping and there is now digital access for almost anybody, hmm. but you need to intellectually decide, I'm going to be a connected person and accept that this is a source of information that can allow me to live a better life. Yeah, and I think, you know, I feel that the, the changes that are happening now in our society and the changes that are happening in our technology are happening so fast that I'm having trouble keeping on top of it, that right. I'm constantly surprised. And you and I will do this to, to each other all the time. I'll be like, hey, have you seen this thing yet? And you're like, no, this is the most <laughs> useful thing that's ever been presented yeah, to me. This yeah. is going to change everything. And then, you know, a week later, you go, oh, yeah, and by the way, you remember that thing you showed me last week? Now I'm making it do this. And I'm like... You know, yeah, and so there's yeah. this, you know, and this is people who are constantly on the lookout for it, who are attempting to incorporate it into our lives as quickly as possible. Yeah. And yet, you know, and still I'm completely overwhelmed by this, by the science and technology. And so I see yeah. people who, who are just disconnected from it and they're just, they, they are in many cases kind of slipping behind. Now, maybe the mm -hmm. onus is then on the technologist to to make things more accessible, make things easier for people to use, but then that's 
very specifically saying, don't worry about the science that's going on here. Right, and that's not the answer. We need to teach yeah. people the problem-solving skills. I, <laughs> I had a rant at one of with not at with one of my staff earlier today, because because he and I live on the cutting edge of technology, and we have to figure every bloody thing out for ourselves. And and I know you're in the exact same boat. And then we turn around and we have people asking us, "Well, I need you to explain this to me. I need you to do the and." And then getting very, um, like, it, we're morally required to explain all of the, and yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. But the point being that really, you know, you can't expect everybody to kind of dive in as deep as, as we like to go with this technology and with the science. But and, there is a certain level. I, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm, I experience this with my kids, you know, that I'm teaching them to be skeptics and rational thinkers as just like a baseline. And where they yeah. go with that doesn't really matter. But, um, you know, I'm teaching and, them how and to... And you didn't say it, but you're teaching them problem solving as well, which is a third step to it. Yeah, yeah. But, like, we'll watch an episode. We watch, I watched The Man of Steel just yesterday, and uh, I, we loved it, but there was a ton of product placement, and it was very subtle, including a product placement for LexCorp, which I thought was awesome. But, uh, you know, there's a point where, you know, this is not really a spoiler, someone gets smashed through a 7-Eleven, and my son goes, oh, product placement... <laughs> <laughs> for 7-Eleven. Right. And so, you know, there's this kind of the skepticism and sort of this rational thinking that's going on all the time. And and maybe if, if we could just get people to to learn those skills. Well, it's, I, I, I really do think problem solving plays just as much a, a part of it because I know you hand you or I a new piece of technology and we, we start figuring out on our own how to use it. You or I break something um, and... We can't always fix it, but we can at least figure out in what direction we broke it. And and that ability to look at your reality and see how pieces fit together and see how to problem solve solutions to uh, basic problems to figure out how to problem solve how to use a piece of new software, how to ask questions that allow you to figure out how to engage in new situations. That is an additional skill that it comes out of the basic scientific method. You hypothesize, yeah. you test, you figure out if it's right. And that, I think, is just as necessary. Um, because, I mean, imagine all the hours people are going to waste if they wait for someone like you or I to teach them how to use a Google Hangout. Just oh, yeah. do it. Just do <laughs> just, it. Just do it and, until you break it. And then, yeah. You know, yeah. No, and, I, and again, I've kind of taught my kids the, you know, 90% of their troubleshooting issues have gone away in our house yeah. now because it's like, did you restart it? <laughs> did, you it? did you retry it? Have you reinstalled yeah. it? You know, like, you know, and now Google it because that's all I would yeah. do. Um, right, right. Right? But I think that, uh, but so maybe that's it. Maybe that's just the heart of it. And I think, you know, we're starting to run out of time here. So that if that if we could somehow give future generations time to just really learn and internalize the scientific method yeah and to sort of use that to study their their lives around yeah. them that that would become this tool set that they could then use for the rest of their life that, that everything they see they could bring in into the sort of filter of the of the scientific method right just learn understand and and imagine how different television would be if you got to watch people trying to figure out how to solve their problems instead of always waiting for people to solve their problems yeah cool well this is great thank you very much pamela it, it's been my pleasure okay stop save <laughs> and speaking of kids now i have to repay the reaper so i will be uh, taking them for ice cream <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's only eight fifty there. Yeah, yeah. So Okay. Um and I will export. Yep. And then I will Alright, we're safe. We are safe, but for how long? Um okay, so uh let's see. Let me see go through here a bit. Get some questions. Um, Randy eight one one eight says, "Without science, we'd be living in the Middle Ages." Exactly. Uh, James Haney says, "People will die for their Xbox, but will pillory against a super collider." That is absolutely true. 
Um, James Haney also says that we'll be in the second dark age if some have their way. We have to fight the almost involuntary ignorance of modern society. That's his thing. That is it. It is this voluntary ignorance, which is which is enraging. Yeah, it's the you know, anti-intellectualism. Yeah, yeah. You're like I don't. Not only do I need, I don't need to know how this stuff works. You're a bad person if you want to know how this stuff works. Now give me the next smartphone. Yeah, it's it's exhausting. Yeah, yeah. It's to the fact that I'm the smart girl in the room shouldn't be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy eight one eight is also saying that in China and India, the STEM fields are seen as the ticket out of poverty, which I think is yeah. what you really had. Yeah. On. And I think that you know that comes back to our the conversation we're having that you know where I'm the sort of pessimist is that it, it almost feels like. China needs to start in you know like if the next smart the next really successful smartphone is invented in China not just built in China but actually innovated. you know innovated in China and we're all buying the the Chinese yeah. version you know the, the whatever is the next great technological leap and it is yeah. Chinese made in the way that we buy the Japanese made I think that may help encourage although I guess it you know maybe didn't really when the Japanese made that leap forward past the United States in terms of a lot of science and technology. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, Dan Bice says, thanks for the double feature. I guess in July while you're gone, I'll have to go outside to play. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. So so just to kind of give people that warning, um, we're going to be gone for a goodly chunk of, of July. So Yeah, I'm traveling July 7 to August 7 and while I may be able to do some recording while I'm gone, I think we're just going to work our butts off beforehand, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and put a bunch of shows in the stream, so. Yeah. The the great goal, I mean, we've we've caught up and a big thanks to Courtney Hogan for helping to kind of wrangle us and yeah. figure out our schedules and stuff. Um And and we unfortunately Preston went on vacation, so he he's now getting tortured with the backlog yeah. we created of audio. Yeah. But the goal, yeah, yeah, the goal really is for it to be we record on Mondays, the YouTube gets put into the YouTube feed, the audio gets put into the audio feed. It all happens within a day. And the way you expect, and that we understand that that's the goal, and you know we're going to try and get to that point that it's we're both doing video and we've got audio coming out at the right time. And I suspect and, the audio will always lag by one week. Um, not just because, maybe I don't know if it has to lag by a week. Um, but, but anyway, this one is a full time job, so and we can't afford a full time audio editor. Mm, so. That's true. That's true. Maybe it will lag a week. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, cool. Well, I think I'm going to go buy some ice cream now. Okay. Uh, Michael Jobin asks, will the first robotic program be affected by sequester? Do you know what that is? The first robotic? It's the capital? Oh, yeah, I do. I do, yeah, it will be. Yeah. If, it, if it's anything, it will be affected by the sequester, right? Um, so so it's, it's actually not sequestration that will affect it. What's going to affect it is if the president's budget is passed. There is a bill circulating in Congress that uh, would... Uh, mandate that the what <laughs> what the president's budget wants to do won't be allowed. Um, so there's an interesting and long protracted battle ahead. What's at issue is the new funding for um, the new funding calls for programs are being put on hold while Congress and the president battle over a budget. So programs that are up for renewal, um, the funding for that renewal doesn't exist. Right. Um, okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we've got, all the comments we've got. So okay. thanks again, Pamela. I will see you later. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, the next thing is going to be the... Have you got anything on Wednesday, Learning Space? Yes. There okay. will be a Learning Space at 4 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, midnight London uh, on Wednesday. Okay, cool. And then we'll be doing, uh, there's going to be a weekly space hangout on Friday hosted by Amy Share Title. So that sounds great. Yeah, she's going to do a great job. Uh, and then I will be back. I'm going to be missing the virtual star party on Sunday, and then I'll be back next week. So we'll talk that then. Sounds great. Okay. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you all uh, next time. Sounds good. <laughs> bye bye.